All right, all right. What's going on, everybody? It's uh, Sunday, 12 p.m. almost, uh, September 20th. My name is Amal. I have Fassel on the call here with me. We're going to review all the things that have happened in the market, in the U.S. equities market um, last week. And then we're also going to check out, you know, what we're thinking about the market for the, um, for the week ahead. So welcome, Fassel. What's up, man? Great to be here. So what's going on, man? How did you, uh, what did you think about last week? You, you know, we were talking about how there's a, the whole quad witching happening of multiple quarterly expiries, you know, monthly expiries of options and futures happening on Friday. Uh, and you said you saw some very interesting, you know, setups of, of volume in different assets. So can you go over that a little bit? Yeah. <laughs> well, first of all, thank you for clearing it up because I was coming to you thinking, that there was just some massive institution that was either buying or selling because towards the last five minutes of Friday, and keep in mind, I had no idea that it was like a quad witching. <laughs> so so <laughs> what, towards the last five minutes, I was seeing a lot of the, like these chunks of volume. I really couldn't tell whether it was buying, selling, covering, whatever it was. I couldn't tell the, the flow of it because the volatility really wasn't matching. I couldn't, I just couldn't make out the flow. Um, but I just started to see this, these huge amount of volumes across multiple sectors and multiple stocks. You know, you look at, I was looking at MRK. I was looking at MDB. I was looking at, uh, uh, what's another one that had a weird volume, Uber. I mean, all of these stocks saw tremendous amounts of volume towards the last five minutes or something like that. And it was just, it was so weird. And I think if you go on the daily um, chart, you could see that it's relatively higher, um, at least than its average uh, for, uh, for Merck, I think Uber was the one that had a really big one that I was like, that's that's kind of weird. Um, yeah, okay, that's kind of relatively a big day. Um, so I started to see that across multiple industries. And when I start to see that type of unity, I get a little bit nervous. Um, you know, it was just a crazy week as far as the volume was concerned. A lot of stocks saw elevated, elevated volume throughout the week, uh, probably in preparation for that quad witching. But um, overall, basically how the market positioned itself for next week, I actually have no idea. Like usually I come into these videos feeling kind of confident about one way or the other, but my God, we were supposed to, this market was supposed to break down Thursday when it opened down 300 points and it didn't. It, it recovered very nicely, held some very key uh, levels, not just in, uh, from the index standpoint, but also from the leadership standpoint, you saw cats or you, you saw stocks like cat, um, the airlines were doing fairly well. I think Thursday, they kind of sold off Friday, but you saw a lot of the bailout stocks do well for, for the majority of the week and definitely the industrials. And towards the, the end on Friday, um, I alerted our community that the healthcare stocks, whether you're looking at the healthcare insurers, the definitely the pharmaceuticals, um, Eli Lilly and MRK, they were all showing a lot of good, good signals for a market that had closed broadly down. And you know, when I start to see stocks like Dollar General make an all-time high despite the market coming down or, or just different bullish signals that are contrarian to the overall direction of the indexes, that really makes me feel like, okay, um, you know, at least in this standpoint, the bulls look like they may have the upper hand despite the indexes looking like they're, they're weak. And so just to wrap up everything that I saw last week, you had a lot of leadership stocks make really significant gains in, in other industries besides the, the tech industries. Um, high growth industries, high growth stocks, whether you're talking software, uh, cybersecurity, they're still struggling. I did see some good buying towards the end on Friday, but ultimately there's no buy signal that I've come across yet. Uh, the only thing that we can, you know, if you're a bull that you can be happy about is that there's no sell signal. These stocks look like they're kind of just chopping and, and trading and waiting for the next move. Um, but it's it's really weird because you're starting to see the momentum go into other sectors and and other industries as high growth is kind of consolidating. So it'll it'll be something to watch for next week. I think at this point it's really uncertain where the market wants to go. But ultimately, you are probably going to have different sectors lead the market if it's going to go up. So I mentioned Friday that housing still looked really good from a technical standpoint. Whether you're talking about DHI, PHM are two of my favorites. Um, the industrial sector, URI, CAT, um, there's another one, Eaton. Those three are really good. And then, um, oh, also another interesting thing. The transports have been doing really well too. 
I mean, you're talking about UNP made an all-time high, the biggest railroad company in America, despite rail traffic being down, I don't know, like 5% this quarter. You had that stock make an all-time high this week. And that's also really impressive. That's the biggest position within the IYT, the transportation sector ETF. Um, so it's very important to the transportation sector as a whole if, if you watch that. So there were a lot of encouraging signs uh, from the three sectors that I talked about, healthcare, industrials, and housing. If you're going to see this market go up, it's probably going to be led by them. Now, as far as tech and high growth are concerned, I still think you can find really good values in there, like relative to where they were, I guess, a month ago when everyone still thought they were expensive. But that's a that's something to sort out. And I I don't think it's it's worth playing just yet until we see how this market shakes out. But once again, I think you will continue to see these stocks struggle. If they don't if if they're not going to struggle next week, you will probably see a very good bounce. Monday or Tuesday, but if there's no bounce, no momentum Monday, Tuesday, I'll probably bet that these stocks see another leg down. And at this point in time, I, I'm sure that the market will be led down by tech, but you will still see sectors, whether it's housing, healthcare, industrial, fare much better than, than tech and probably the broad indexes overall. Yeah, a lot to uh, lot to digest. Um, <laughs> yes. So, so I mean, first thing, first thing I definitely want to talk about is yeah, that the quad witching is definitely you know you could see it visible as you stated on stocks like Uber, um, stocks like Merck. You said right. Yeah. Uh, and I think it's I think it's uh, visible in, in numerous areas of the market. I think we just haven't kind of like tapped into those areas. But I think you know for our viewers, if you guys want to look at different stocks, you will see basically the impact of these quarterly um, you know, options and futures contracts, monthlies, single stock options and futures, all coming to a close um, Friday. And that's effectively, you know, what, what's called a quad witching. And triple, triple witching is like just a terminology that people say, all those contracts effectively get closed out, you know, the last hour or two of um, the last, you know, Friday trading day or trading day. Uh, and that's why you see basically, you know, if you look at, let's just say an hourly candle, you'll see massive volume in the last hourly candle compared to any other candle surrounding it. So point is, um, you know, I, I do think that there is definitely notable signs in the market that would kind of give us an indication, you know, maybe this is selling, maybe this is buying, but we don't really know, <laughs> right? Like it yeah. seemed like the market was breaking down, especially the S and P 500 because it broke below the 50 moving average, um, you know, over here on the daily time frame, but it wasn't really like one of those close where it closes where it was satisfying. It was like, wait a second, like, yeah, it's breaking a key moving average is breaking below, you know, some of these key levels, but holy crap, it like came back inside its previous range. Did you kind of look at that in the same way? Um, not specifically that range. I think, yes, you can say that I think the range that you defined is, is correct. And I think, sure, you could assume that it was supposed to break below there and it didn't. That was the previous low made on the 13th. But um, I, I just, I've, I've been mostly focused on the individual stock leadership to tell me the direction of the market because the indexes I think are just predominantly being led by tech selling off. And, and basically what I've seen in, seen in the past week is that there's a lot of money that's being moved moving around into other sectors and you're seeing just as i mentioned unp made an all-time high dollar general made an all-time high you're seeing these stocks in other sectors outperform tech and so ultimately i i, I want to say that you know it, it came back in and that's a positive sign but if tech continues to struggle um i i doubt that that the s p can hold above that level and it will probably dip down below that range um so it's it's really key just to it's really hard to figure out just where this market's going. Cause like, I, I think that's been the theme for this entire year is that you can't define the market by just the indexes themselves. You have to define them by the individual sectors because that's just what's been going up throughout this entire year is like you've, you've seen obviously the tech sector just dominate all the, the gains throughout the year, but you've seen sectors like housing come back up from the bottom. You've seen um, industrials come back, up close to the bottom and, and they all happen at different times. And, and, you know, sometimes industrials will move up the most when tech moves down the most. And, and it's just this kind of back and forth within the market. But like I said, if you continue to have tech being the one to underperform the most, naturally it'll probably drag down the indexes like the S and P and NASDAQ below um, range levels or support levels like the uh, 50 day moving average. Um, but it's still nothing to be, 
like totally negative on the market against because like I said, there could be other sectors that will continue to go up even as tech and, and the majority of the indexes break down those levels. Below yeah. Those levels. I, I kind of agree with you. I mean, it definitely, you know, it's, it's a sector to sector play and I think you're probably the best to look at the market from that perspective. Um, I think the only thing that I was kind of looking at the market from just, you know, say the, the technical perspective or say the um, narrative shift perspective is I'm not seeing like any reasons for the market to start breaking down um, at this particular point because I'm thinking, okay, well, last week was probably a great week to capitalize on momentum, you know, especially in tech, but it seemed like the bears kind of just fumbled. Did you get that sense of feeling or? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like I said on, I, I think it was Thursday when we opened down a large amount, but we ended up recovering um, at the end of the day. I believe it was Thursday. That was the day that I thought the, the bears were going to win. And I thought we were going to see some really significant selling. And when the market closed, it didn't close really positive on Thursday, but it closed just enough to where I was like, damn, okay, the bears missed their shot. They got the, the odds are still in their favor for the next day, but I really thought they were going to take it down again. And then the next day, they open the market up a little bit, sell it off um, below some key levels, but then buy it, the the bulls end up buying it back, and and the bears kind of fumble it exactly as you said. Um, I still think you know going into next week, I'm still majority short, and I still believe that uh, you know the market is leaning more towards going down than up. And I'm speaking from a broad sense. You know, I'm not shorting things like housing or industrials or healthcare, but when I say, you know, the market's probably going to go down, I, I usually mean tech and high growth and, and most of the sectors. Um, I still think it, the bears are in favor, but once again, it, it, it not, not only does it seem like they fun, funneled a, <laughs> fumbled the bag, but they just don't have the strength to beat the bulls. Like it just felt like every time they had a down cycle, a miniature down cycle, like, I'm sorry, a short-term down cycle, it just was met with such strong buying that would take the stock back above those those uh, support levels that it just broke. And it was like, man, the bears cannot catch a break. It's like the strength is just totally opposite. Um, whether the bears have really weak hands or they're willing to, to cover a lot faster than, than bulls are willing to sell, I don't know. But uh, bears definitely seem like they just don't have the strength, period. Yeah. Yeah, they definitely don't. Um, although, you know, I think looking at Apple or I don't know if Tesla kind of had the same print. Um, no, it no, does not. Not at sadly. all. No, I, I was kind of just only looking at the Friday candle here. Um, yeah, Tesla's Friday candle uh, obviously closed a little bit better. But, you know, still like Apple, man, it, it got really sold off aggressively. Um, I, I want to say Microsoft had similar. Yeah. Microsoft a little bit better, maybe like a hammer or something, but gosh, you know, I'm looking at the market, like, you know, most of tech look pretty brutal Friday, but then I think you had mentioned in some of your analysis that uh, cat and industrials looked quite a bit better, right? Yeah. A ton, they looked a ton better. As I just said, um, UNP made an all time high this week, which is probably one of the most integral transportation stocks in the entire market, probably is the biggest transportation stock in the entire market. And for it to make an all time high when the market is under this much pressure is, is such a key sign. It's such a very good sign. Uh, it really makes me feel like I don't want to be short this market, that this market wants to go up. But once again, you can't really define the market by just one entity. It's, it's still secular as it's trying to tell you now. And you kind of just have to play it that way. So do you think so, so does this kind of play into your theory of, you know, the, the rotations from away <laughs> from tech and high growth and into industrial or, you know, value stocks, or oh, are we uh, kind of, kind of away from that still? I don't know. I was, I was totally wrong on it earlier this year. And I really thought that there was going to be some type of shift from tech to, to deep value. And over the, over the course of, I want to say a month to two months, I've, I've really tried to understand how money can flow throughout the market and, and where the changes are. And for about a month and a half, it just seemed like everything was still going into tech. Tech was just going up like crazy. And then now as tech's starting to come down, you're starting to see this, this relative outperformance in these other sectors. So I, yeah, there is some type of rotation, but I, I don't think, um, 
I don't think it's as simple as I thought it was going to be as far as money move out of expensive and into cheap. Um, I think how we define cheap is really going to be interesting. And I think that's, that's where the disparity is. And that's where people make mistakes is what exactly is cheap in this market. Um, because are you talking cheap in terms of their, their relative performance for the next year or cheap uh, for the relative performance in five years? What are people paying for now? And I still feel like people are paying for next year's earnings. They're not buying things like the airlines or the cruises that should be fine within five years or, or six years. Um, they're not buying those yet. They're still buying the stuff that's kind of either you have one gap, like one down year, like the industrials, whether they have a down year this year, next year is supposed to be really good. Um, whether it's the, the analysts are baking in the infrastructure deal numbers or, or, you know, the global growth coming back, whatever the case may be, it just feels like that's what people are buying. And I don't think it's as simple as saying, um, like I was saying earlier, it's, it's going to be like a play into value. I was saying buy energy and financials and those, those guys are just still sucking wind. So um, once again, it, it's, it's a mix. It's not necessarily going to go into cheap value, but more so performance cheapness or performance value, I guess. So you'll still find these, these quote, ch good cheap stocks in the healthcare sector, even though the healthcare sector is close to its high, it's, it's not like it's cheap relative to uh, um, financials, which are so far from their high. Um, you can still find value stocks within the financial sector. And as I mentioned before, I was seeing good signs from the pharmaceutical companies, the insurance companies. And keep in mind, these companies are growing double digits this year and next year. So for a company like MRK, I checked, I think it's growing 8% this year and 11% next year. Um, Eli Lilly growing 18% this year. And then I think 12% next year, something like that. They are growing double digits this year, and next year. And ultimately, those are the quote cheap stocks that I think people will start to pay up for because they've already paid up a huge amount for tech. And I think we're starting to see that that simmer down a bit, but ultimately they're not feeling comfortable enough to buy up the really deep, deep value stocks like the airlines and the cruises. So once again, it's kind of that middle ground and, and that's where it's really tough to define it. But that's, that's my theory and, and how I'm going about it. So, do you have a theory on exactly, you know, exactly why you think that people are still kind of flowing into maybe high growth in tech and not going into financials? Do you think this is all still coronavirus related, economic woes that people are still seeing in the market? And they think that, well, I'd rather be in tech because that's where the momentum is. And that's technically, you know, a, a safe sector, if you will, because we don't know how long this is going to last. People are pro probably going to be more and more dependent on technology. Are you thinking in that same manner? Kind of. Like, I, th I think, yeah, tech is growing at substantial rates. So what used to be considered a growth company before this whole crisis was you kind of had to grow double digits on earnings, maybe grow double digits on revenue, depending on what industry you were in. Um, but now it just seems like people assume that just because Zoom, I think we went over it, last week zoom was growing expected to grow 600 percent next year and then in 2022 they're only expected to grow four percent so you're seeing that compression at least from the the time frame that we're in now and how we look at it from two years out people are expecting a huge uh decline in growth at least in 2022 and i think you could look at multiple companies earnings whether it's coop um I think zscaler just multiple high growth companies that have been extended both in technicals and and premiums um, but are at, also at the forefront of that technological innovation that's that's been very fastly adopted through this virus, you're seeing their earnings estimates come down for 2022. So ultimately, yeah, that, that party has to stop. And I think people who are not paying attention to those declines are going to end up getting hurt. The question is, are investors still going to value that next year 600% boom uh, versus the 2022 boom? And And I don't, or I'm sorry, the 2022 decline. And at this point, I don't really know. And that's why I think you're going to see a lot of consolidation in this sector, um, probably for the remainder of the year, as the winners get sorted out, the losers get sorted out, and, and things become more clear as far as who really has the longevity to dominate in this environment, and who's seen the most um, long-term adoption, more importantly, um, as a result of this crisis. But, uh, you know, like I said, high growth is, is being redefined and growth in general is being redefined. Like 
for instance, I, I just mentioned Merck and Eli Lilly, you know, DHI, one of the biggest comp or DR Horton, which is, I believe the biggest housing construction company home builder in the, uh, in the U S they're growing double digit earnings and revenue this year, and next year. Like you, you really tell me that this stock does not deserve to be trading at a higher premium or even way beyond where it's at now, because it's never grown this fast. I think as far as uh, maybe in the past, I think when I looked at it, maybe in the past six years, it has not grown this fast at all. And so you're seeing that rate of acceleration, whether it's through low interest rates or whatever the case may be, you're seeing that also push, uh, you know, stocks like these to, to higher highs. But ultimately, as long as this can, growth continues, you will probably see these sectors continue to push their elevations, not to the same degree that, that tech did because the growth is, you know, they're not producing triple digit growth, but ultimately you're going to see elevated premiums relative to where they were probably pre-COVID. Um, so once again, you know, you, you're going to see these, these pockets of outperformance and you have to just keep in mind that there are other sectors that are growing. It's not just tech. Um, you know, I know people want to assume that tech has the safety because there's a huge technological adoption boom that's happening right now, but there's also other, other trends that are happening, whether you're talking about the, the innovation in the healthcare space, whether it's uh, vir virus detection or, or pathogen detection. I think that industry is booming right now because of coronavirus. Um, and just like I said with housing, the housing, the home builders are booming right now. They're expecting double digit growth this year, next year. Um, a company like Zillow just hit an all time high, I believe, um, just this week. So you're seeing a lot of good trends take place. And I think if people want to stay in tech because it's safe, I think that's, that's just you holding on to what was, what was working in the past three months. I don't think you can consider tech as the safe play at this point because enough sectors around the market have shown you, hey, we're still grow to, growing and we're actually growing double digit rates um, this year, next year. So there's like the safety premium is starting to disapparate for tech, in my opinion. I think it's, it's becoming less and less safe as the other sectors start to show, shore up their earnings uh, more and more. What do you think exactly is happening in housing? Because it seems so disconnected with what's happening in the economy, right? I like it's if you're looking at the unemployment numbers. Yeah. I mean, it definitely seems disconnected, but you know, the housing numbers that keep coming out, whether it's the low interest rates that are fueling people, I've talked to a couple of my friends who are pretty young. Um, well, I definitely didn't think they were at the age to get a house. They're actually getting a house um, because interest rates are so low. And I don't know if there's that trend of, of an increased, um, buyer pool because like i said i would have never expected my friends who are like 28 29 to, to be buying a house at this point um maybe that's that's affecting this trend and i remember there was a lot of skepticism about millennials owning homes at least in the past five years i remember seeing a ton of stories about that that's why home builders were were very uncertain assets because the narrative was young people wanted to live in the city and and be in more vibrant communities and not live in the suburbs but now I think with, with the gift of low interest rates, you may start to see um, an increased pool of buyers. And so that, that could be something that could propel this industry for the next one to two years. At least that's what the estimates are suggesting. You know, the growth is going to be here for the next one to two years. So I don't know. It's, ultimately, you could see the, the high unemployment number bite us back in the butt. But um, I think more time has to elapse before we really figure out how that's going to affect us. Yeah, fair point. Um, so what else are you looking at for, for the week ahead? I mean, what can our viewers sort of, uh, you know, take away from s some of this conversation? What should they be looking forward to? And are you still pretty much thinking you'll take it one day at a time next week? Yeah, <laughs> definitely. I'm going into Monday, like with my hand on the cover trigger, because you know, I'm, I'm mostly short, I'm about like less than 9% or less than 10% long. So I still have a good amount of shorts. I have close to 50% short. Um, I reduced a, a good amount of short exposure on Friday, actually, because once I saw the market was was being bought up and IWM crossed back above its 153 level, I was like, "Damn, I gotta like, I gotta just take some profit here. I gotta, I I gotta just trim down a bit because the odds of this market going up now have just increased <laughs> to a level that I I really didn't think. Um, so at least in the prior days before Friday, so. Um, I'm going into it with an open mind. I really don't expect anything. I think uh, it can go either way. Just based on the leadership, 
Um, this continues to be a secular market. You could, as I said before, see sectors like the healthcare, industrial, housing sector go up or stay flat while the broad market goes down, which is led by tech and high growth. They'll continue to see selling as as their valuations come, you know, <laughs> closer to some. I don't even know. It's not even a valuation story anymore, but just as people continue to take profit, you have no idea when, when they're going to stop taking profit. So uh, yeah, I think it's just, it's just a wait and see, but I, I wouldn't count out uh, the market bouncing from here. And I've, I've been a fairly, not a big bear, but I've been bearish for about, uh, I want to say a month or so, maybe three weeks. And this is the first time where I'm feeling like, okay, this market has shown me some really good signs and, and I'm starting to get a little bit nervous. You know, even though Friday closed bad, I want everyone to understand that even though Friday and Thursday closed bad, that's not an indication of where the market's going. It, it really isn't. And I think, uh, you know, anything can happen. So just be prepared. It's definitely going to be a very volatile week next week. Um, just what, are, what, are some, what are some signs, you know, let's just say, um, let's just say, you know, some of the signs that we're looking for strength uh, are wrong. And what is the other side of the, the picture, which is what are some signs of weakness that we should be looking for just in case, you know, the market, you know, is starting to break down? What should we be looking oh. at? Uh, good question. Um, so you could really watch what I like to watch is NVIDIA. NVIDIA has been my main stock because ultimately uh, when I go, when a correction happens or any pullback happens, I usually like to find the number one stock that I want to buy in case it pulls back. And NVIDIA is at the top of my list. It beat, my, beat out Microsoft. I think Microsoft's going to see some headwinds in relation to its gaming category. Um, so I'm actually neutral on Microsoft. They used to be my number one pick, but NVIDIA is the key dog to watch. And I think well, if you start seeing video break down below that 468 level, that's a really bad sign. And it's not only just a bad sign for tech, it's a bad sign for the broad market in general. It would be a bad sign for even stocks in the healthcare, industrial, housing sector, even though they're totally unrelated. It would just be a terrible sign. If there's one stock that I expect to stabilize and hold up, even as the market goes through the secular rotation or this you know secular cycle, whatever you want to call it, um, it would be NVIDIA. So NVIDIA needs to hold up. Same with Apple and um, same with, uh, what's another stock that I would watch? Coupa has been a leader that I've watched in the software space, of space, but it's really been hit hard after earnings. It's down, I think, 100 points from its high. Um, you know, it's starting, to show some, it's starting to show some stabilization here, but ultimately you want to watch a lot of the, the support levels of the high growth players, whether it's Coupa, Okta, Zscaler, Fastly, Lavongo. Um, you want to watch a lot of their short-term support levels, where they made their bottoms either a week ago or, or whatever. They need to hold those bottoms. Um, another thing that I'm also watching is I want to see the IWM hold up a little bit more. It's it's actually been a outperforming relative to the other indexes, at least on Friday it was, um, which was very surprising to me. But uh, I want to start seeing that, that uh, index outperform because – if you, I, I, like, I have a feeling if you start to see the healthcare, industrial, and, and housing sectors outperform, I really think small caps, that'll really benefit in the small caps favor. And it's not because the IWM is made up of those companies, which obviously there are some companies in the industrial housing healthcare sector that are in the IWM ETF, but uh, I think it, it goes along with that kind of value rotation that I was speaking on earlier. So if I start to see the IWM get above, let's just say, for instance, um, let me look at it on my thing real quick. Give me one second. Uh, da, 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 da. Hmm. This thing taking a long time to go. All right, I don't know why my thing is not loading. Let me try one more. Okay, this one is running. Why the hell is it running? Okay, if I could just see IWM get above 156 and hold above 156, that'd be a very good positive sign. Um, I doubt that it's it's going to get there because once again, there's still so much economic weakness in relation to, to the small business sector. But I mean, I guess these companies aren't like mom and pop shops. They're not actual small small businesses. But uh, you know, the IWM has usually been the the leading 
index when the market wants to decline because it's the highest risk asset um, index. So you usually see IWM sell off before the broad market because people want to get out of their high risk assets before they get out of their, their cheaper value assets. But ultimately, just to wrap everything up, I'm pretty much watching the high growth leaders, um, the big tech leaders like Apple and NVIDIA, and then also the IWM, just to give me some more evidence on the ro rotational theory that could be playing out. I still don't know if I trust it yet, but uh, that's definitely something that I've seen as far as the leadership, what the leadership is telling me in those sectors. So that's, that's basically what I'm looking for. Perfect. Um, any last thoughts on Tesla? Dude, I'm okay. So I'm still short this, this stock. Okay. This stock is just, I hate it. I didn't realize that this stock gets a stupid update or upgrade every three days. Like, I mean, yeah. every single person comes out and upgrades the stock every three days. And I'm like, damn, okay. I, I can I catch a break. Um, at this point though, it's like, you know, if the market does want to continue to go up, I actually think Tesla will probably outperform stocks like Apple and Nvidia. I, I just had this feeling. Um, and it's partially due to the fact that uh, other uh, electric car companies have been doing really well. And even the, the big lithium player ALB has been doing extremely well over the past couple of days as the market has come down. Like you look at a stock like Workhorse, I think I checked, it just hit an all time high, like very recently, WKHS, yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah, and do, you know what's even cooler? I think, you know, Hui in our, in our Discord group, I yeah. remember him telling people that he was getting in at like 16 and a half bucks, like or 17 bucks or something. And look at that stock. Like that's a huge amount of gain. So first of all, congratulations to Hui for that. That was an awesome trade. Um, and once again, this stock, when I see this relative outperformance in the market, I don't, I don't know what to make of these electric car companies because yeah, they're overvalued, but they're also part of the future that I think we all know is coming. So when I see workhorse make all time high, it really makes me feel good about Tesla. When I see ALB outperform it, once again, it makes me feel good about Tesla. They're all sort of related. And ultimately if, if I continue to see workhorse outperform, I'll probably end up being forced to cover my Tesla because there's, it's, I just have this feeling the technicals line up. It's just one of those stocks that's holding up far better than the rest of its uh, tech peers. So even though it's, it could be because of the upgrade, it's, at this point, it may not be something I want to fight because of how the peers are, are doing. So Tesla is definitely one that I got my finger on the cover trigger like Monday if, if things look like they're going the other way. Perfect. Good to know, man. Um, yeah, I just want to let our viewers know that you know, other than Fassel and myself, we have a ton of people who are pretty active in our community. Uh, uh, Hui is one of them. Um, v is another guy. There's a, there's a bunch of people who, you know, post all kinds of things that they're looking at in the market. Um, and so, you know, this is a great community. If you want to test out your skills of how to analyze markets or how we analyze markets and how we trade them, um, come join our Discord community. The link is below. Hit the thumbs up if you enjoy our content. Again, um, our website is thealphatrace.com. You could go to the products page, buy our membership, and you get access to all these um, lock channels that you see for equities. And then, of course, the crypto side as well. So thanks, everyone, for watching our video. I hope you all enjoy our content. Until then, take care, and we'll catch up with you next week. Peace.